thank you, Bob, and thank you, Jim, for having me out again. It's really a pleasure to talk to a group like this. As, as Bob said, the Pew Research Center is interested in providing good information about data, and I think polling is what we're best known for, but we're interested in a lot of data. I was fascinated to hear the previous conversation because we're really interested in new data and social media and the role that that's played in people's lives as the conduit between citizens and their elected officials, and, and it's a big part of our research agenda. We do a lot of demographic research, we do a lot of other communications and media research, and our objective is to just observe, collect, understand data, understand what it's good for, what it does and doesn't tell you, um, and be a resource for people, regardless of where they are in the political spectrum, where they are in their lifespans, to understand that information and data better. Uh, and, and the Pew Charitable Trust has been incredible in, in supporting that endeavor and, and, and keeping us rolling. Jim asked me to sort of step back and, and, and go a little big picture here about the political situation today. Uh, I do a lot of public opinion polling, a lot of election polling, uh, a lot of political <coughs> issue polling. In, in the meantime, I'm as fascinated as all of us to hear what Charlie Cook's going to say about the strategic environment this year. Uh, but I'm going to step back and talk a little more broadly about where the public is uh, and what the trends are that we're seeing with a particular focus on uh, the millennial generation, so to speak, the younger uh, generation, and what that signals for the direction of movement, the direction of the conversation in the American political debate uh, in terms of what we see within that generation and what dynamics that we're seeing there. But uh, there, was a, there was a little insert in your packet, I think, that had some data on it that gave me something I could point to as I was talking. Um, let me start with the, with the bad news that I think everybody knows, which is that the Republican Party faces a, 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 a kind of image deficit right now politically, and that's been around for the better part of the last 10 years. Uh, you can see it in party identification trends, <clears throat> where the proportion of Americans who identify with the parties had narrowed in the early part of the 2000s and widened again in the late part of the 2000s uh, and has stayed fairly wide. Although the trend, and I think this is important, is simply away from party identification in general. Uh, that the Democratic identification peaked in 2008 uh, during the enthusiasm of that election cycle, but has waned. <clears throat> it hasn't been a zero-sum game. Both parties are losing at this time. Both parties' images are suffering over the course of this period uh, in terms of favorability ratings, in terms of leadership approval ratings, in terms of any of the metrics that we commonly use to measure party images. Um, there are a couple things that I think are important to know about that issue or that image differential between Republicans and Democrats. One of them is that Republicans tend to score lower on a lot of measures, not only because the general public views the party more negatively, but because Republicans themselves are more critical of their own party than Democrats are of their party. In other words, a lot of the differential is, is the, um, the, the impression that, that adherents offer. Uh, of their own leadership. And that's what I put in, in figure two over here. Uh, when you look at favorability ratings of the parties, 87% of Democrats offer a positive assessment of, the, of their party. 74% of Republicans offer a positive assessment of their party. Still positive, but a differential. If you go farther to the right of figure two, I think this is where you see it even more. Uh, the Rep Dem in numbers there are raw identification, but if you look at the leaners who are critical elements of an election constituency, certainly critical elements of a, a strategy to increase engagement and increase turnout, um, these are the potential voters, but the ones who could slip away. You see that differential even more substantially. Democratic leaners like the Democratic Party by a 70 to 13 mark, or I'm sorry, a 70%, I, I read that wrong. Uh, they dislike the 13% rate the Republican Party favorably, 70% rate their own, the Democratic Party favorably. Only barely half of Republican leaners rate the Republican Party favorably right now. Now that's a challenge strategically for a very important reason, that Republican leaners are a very difficult group to grab onto because they represent two different subgroups internally. One are what you might normally think of as leaners who are younger folks, haven't really formed a political identity, uh, are hearing things that they like about a political party but haven't really locked into uh, that party as something that they identify with. Um, that's a part of that group. The other part of that group, though, are very conservative people 
who don't like what the party is doing right now and don't call themselves Republican anymore, but when you probe them and say, well, which party do you lean to toward, they'll still say they lean Republican. When you look within that Republican-leaning block, you get this really diverse set of opinions within that space uh, of people who are sort of sitting in that, uh, sh that shoulder space, so to speak, politically, uh, for two different reasons. Um, that latter group, those what we sometimes refer to as lapsed Republicans, uh, are fairly reliable voters. Uh, these are people who are extremely engaged in politics, extremely interested in what's going on politically, and extremely unlikely to ever vote Democratic. Um, but there's another group in there who are sort of those soft Republicans, those transitional, let's say, uh, folks who right now in the political spectrum favor the Republican Party, but don't offer a very positive assessment of the Republican Party the way that, that Democrats in that space do. The other, I think, important thing to know about that image differential is that it's, it's almost all about approach to politics. The, the, the deficit, so to speak, uh, for the Republican Party is almost all about their approach to politics more than their actual policy positions. Um, and that's what figure three and four are summarizing that by a 52 to 27 margin, almost two to one, uh, the Democrats are seen as the party more willing to work with the other side, the party more concerned about regular people. Uh, by wide margins, Republicans are seen as the party that's more extreme in its political positions. All of those things are sort of the, the big issue, uh, sort of differentials that are shaping those broader images of the political parties. Um, and, and I think of concern, uh, an item below that in that, uh, which party do you think of as more influenced by lobbyists, uh, that's an issue that typically didn't have a partisan <laughs> break to it in our past polling, but has started to pop in, this set, in, in the latest polls that we've done on that topic as one where we're seeing a difference in perceptions of the political parties. Um, but if you flip over to figure four, there's not a consistent Democratic advantage when it comes to most issues. Uh, the economy being probably the key issue. Republicans have a four-point edge in the latest poll we did in January on this. I think that's consistent what you see in Gallup and other major national polls. Uh, this isn't an issue that the Democrats have any particular advantage on. Uh, the deficit, one that typically plays in the Republicans' favor, but an issue like immigration, as we discussed earlier, is one where neither party has a clear edge in the public side. Um, one thing that I would point out on figure four that I think is critical and we'll come back to in some of the later slide, uh, later part of the, my talk is health care. Uh, the health care, the public support for, for Obamacare has fallen off steeply over the last three months, not surprisingly given what's happened in, in, in October and November and December, but the support levels, the favor of pose levels, however pollsters measure it, are all lower today than they've typically been. But that hasn't translated into a Republican edge on the issue itself. You know, more Americans in virtually every poll I see tell us they still think the Democrats have the better ideas on that issue, despite their dislike of Obamacare right now. And I think that points to another broader in image issue uh, in that differential uh, that I think is, is, is a problem any party who doesn't have the presidency typically faces, which is being seen as the party of no. You know, the party that's just resisting policies and not proposing alternatives. That is a problem for the Republican Party's image right now. Again, it's a problem that every out party, so to speak, faces, uh, depending on who owns, has the presidency and who has the, the pulpit in order of setting the political agenda like that. But that's a part of why I think that, that, that health care number hasn't flipped, even though the numbers on Obamacare have flipped. Let me talk briefly about what we are seeing internally within the Republican Party. Um, my mentor and boss, I don't know if you saw, in the, in, or former boss, uh, Andy Kohut, who was the founding director of Pew Research, published a piece in the Post this weekend about divisions within the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think he's, he's on to something serious. As we look towards 2016, there may be some potential wedges within the Democratic Party that may play out in a, in a primary there where there's no clear a uh, singular figure to keep the party together, as Obama has been over the last six years. Um, 
But the, but the divides within the Republican Party are much more present and much more, uh, uh, much deeper right now. Again, that's characteristic of the party who's out of power. The Democrats had deeper internal divisions in the second term of the Bush presidency over a, a very liberal, very anti-war, very frustrated segment of Democrats and a more centrist set of Democrats who weren't as who were frustrated and down on, on George W. Bush, but weren't as animated and passionate in their feelings about it. Um, the wedge that we see most clearly among Republicans is in terms of the Tea Party identification. And I think the message here, for those of you who work on campaigns, you, I don't need to tell you that in terms of the activism, uh, but that is a real thing in the American public writ large. It is a national phenomenon. Uh, it is a level of passion and engagement differential, but it's a real division that, again, is as much about strategy and approach to politics as it is about actual issue differences or policy preference differences. Um, what we're seeing as the biggest divides internally are over how the party should approach its political uh, decision making and how it should be setting its tone in Washington. Um, if you look at the figure five, this was from a study we did before the shutdown, but I think it prefaced a lot of what was going on in the shutdown. Tea Party and non-Tea Party Republicans agreed that in order to do better in future elections, the Republican Party needs to address major problems, but they fundamentally disagreed about what those problems were and how to address them. So Tea Party Republicans, 51% said, the way to address those problems is to just make a stronger case for our current positions, but by 70 to 26, the non-Tea Party Republicans said, we need to reconsider some of our positions. 53% uh, of Tea Party Republicans said, the problem is we've already compromised too much uh, in the political in the political environment with Democrats, uh, non-Tea Party Republicans only 22% thought that was the case, and by and, and almost twice as many, 39% said the issue was not compromising enough in the political sphere. What that leads to our overall balance of opinion within the Republican Party is very spread out in those dimensions. You have as many in the party overall concerned about being too extreme, too intransigent, too uh, unwilling to compromise. Uh, and just saying no to things, but you also have another substantial set of the party uh, who is very frustrated about having already compromised too much. And figure seven at the bottom uh, highlights that as it comes to the issue of Obamacare particularly. Uh, I've circled under Republicans, you can see, only, well, just above that, by an 89-9 margin, Republicans disapprove of Obamacare. That's, that's fine, that's universal. Uh, but what to do about it is not universal in the party. 41% of Republicans are saying, well, I disapprove of the law, but elected officials who agree with me should be trying to make the law work as well as possible. Another 40% of Republicans, though, are saying, I disapprove of the law, and elected officials who agree with me should be trying to make the law fail. And when you look at that internal division within the parties over to the right, it's by more than two to one, the Tea Party Republicans who are saying, make it fail, and the other group, the non-Tea Party Republicans, by about two to one, saying, I don't like it, but we should be trying to make it work. And so that gets to that strategic issue. There's an agreement on the policy. There's not an agreement about what the approach should be. Um, let me move on and talk a little bit about generations so that we have some time for questions and answers. That trend towards political independence is most powerful among what we refer to as millennials. Uh, this is the youngest current generation, although by the metric that most people have used, these millennials are up to age 33 now. Uh, so it's not an inherently young group. Uh, it, these are folks who are largely past college now, who are in the early parts of their careers, um, but whose first political experiences, I think the best way to think of it, are a post-9-11. Uh, George W. Bush was the president when they were really getting engaged in politics, and for many, 2004, 2008 were the first election cycles that they were really participating in, some 2012, the younger edge of that generation. Um, you can see that there's been a democratic leaning in that uh, generation. Uh, these, again, are the just what do you think of yourself, Republican, Democrat, or independent figures. If you count the leaners, those independents who lean one way or the other, the Democratic Party has a 50 to 34 edge uh, among the millennial generation now. Um, but the trend line again there is moving away from both political parties and in a steeper trajectory than we're seeing among other generations. So to get to 50% independent now for the generation is characteristic of where this group is right now. 
They've been through tough political battles. That the first, their first political experiences were wars in Iraq, a presidency that was very divisive under George W. Bush, um, a very exciting 2008 election, uh, but also an economic crisis that's put an enormous amount of strain on that generation in particular, more so probably than most others in terms of overall impact on jobs, careers, and life trajectories. Um, and who right now are moving away from institutional identifications in almost every dimension we can think of. Uh, whether it's religious identification, it's a generation that's not necessarily less spiritual in the way it thinks of itself, but is far less identified with religious organizations. Uh, it's a generation that doesn't identify with a lot of other groups that we traditionally think of in terms of membership or thinking of themselves as part of something. And to pick up on a theme that came up in just a second ago, it's a generation that thinks of itself as networked rather than identified. They don't place themselves in boxes. They think of themselves in terms of the networks that they build around them. And that's a different view of the world. They think of their own individuality in a whole different way uh, than most other generations do. That means they're less tethered politically than previous generations. And that seems to be the trend uh, it's not just that younger people develop party identifications as they get older. This generation, more than any other that we've seen over the last 60 years when polling data is available, is the first one where we're seeing that trajectory go the other direction. When boomers started, they were independent, but by the time they got into their 30s, they were picking a party. The millennials are moving the other way. As they get older, they're moving away from the political parties. Um, and the other thing that's important to keep in mind about millennials is they don't see the world in the same black and white sense as previous generations. Uh, I put the, on the bottom of, of page three the, the balance of how many call themselves conservative and call themselves liberal. And to be sure, the millennial generation doesn't, you know, they're as likely to call themselves liberal as they are to call themselves conservative. That's unlike any other previous generation. There is a liberal imprint on this generation in terms of many policy areas, but not all. Um, but also, they're not as dug in on what those labels even mean the way previous generations are. A whole conversation about liberal and conservative debates is not a debate, it's not a conversation that particularly engages this generation because it's a conversation that tends to devolve into black and white thinking uh, and seeing things as polar opposites or trade-offs, which is a kind of language that doesn't tend to uh, appeal very much when you think of this generation. And I give you a few examples of that on the last page of this handout, where that liberal imprint is very visible in certain issue areas, but also where the notion that it's, it's, it's an either or proposition is not the language that millennials tend to think in. Um, most obviously, issues like gay marriage, um, race, uh, diversity, immigration, uh, embracing difference, embracing uh, a changing society are things that are the, probably the biggest characteristics of this generation. Uh, so 65% of millennials in our May poll last year uh, supporting gay marriage, uh, that's 14 points higher than the national total, which was 51% then. You all have seen the trajectory on this and what the generational imprint looks like. I don't need to explain it. Um, but you see that in other things, immigration, picking up on Secretary Gutierrez's talk earlier. Uh, this is an issue that is very distinct in the millennial generation. They're very pro towards immigrants as not just a policy issue, but the question I'm showing here, the notion that immigrants strengthen our society rather than pose a risk to our society or, or are a burden on our society, which is the majority view of older generations, particularly 65 and older. The young generation embraces the view that that diversity is a benefit to our society. It's something that's good for our society. And therefore, the rhetoric of law and order that Secretary Gutierrez was talking about is one that really meets a lot of resistance in this generation, partly because it is in and of itself diverse and grew up in that era of diversity uh, and embracing diversity, but partly because they, uh, they think of the world not as a black and white, you know, you broke the law, you have to go home sense, but they're thinking about what role groups play in society and how beneficial that can be. You also see that liberal imprint, so to speak, in views of government. This is a generation that is distinctively uncynical about government. They think government can solve problems. They really do. Uh, throughout the past four years, six years since the, the economic crisis, 
They are the generation that has continued to support a bigger government providing more services rather than a smaller government doing less. It's an old polling question that has been asked for decades. And over the past you know, six years under Obama, the national trend has been towards smaller government. But this is the generation that's, that's continued to voice support for government playing a role in finding solutions to problems. Uh, when we ask people another old polling question, how do you feel about the federal government? Do you feel basically content, frustrated, or angry? Frustrated is the bulk of the answer there, but the balance of anger to contentment is what I think is, 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 is what we often look at. Among people 65 and older, by 7 to 1, 37% to 5, they're angry, not content. And you see that across all generations, except millennials, who on balance, if anything, are more content than angry with government right now. Um, and when it comes to deficit reduction, this is again the one generation over the past two or three years who has consistently on balance supported spending to help the economy recover over deficit reduction, while all other generations have been on the other side of that balance. There is a unique view that government plays a role among this generation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're anti-business, that they're always flatly pro-regulation, because one of the other real characteristics of this generation is a belief in the free market, a belief in individual uh, opportunity, individual strength. Um, I think one of the most remarkable imprints of this generation, given the economic challenges they've faced, is their optimism. Uh, this, most millennials we talk to think they're going to do fine, they think they're going to get ahead, and they often attribute that to their own efforts and their own energy. It is an individualistic generation connected to that notion of a, of a networked generation that thinks of itself as an individual in, in a space, in a networked space, rather than somebody who belongs within an organization. They think of their careers in a networked way. Uh, they think of their, their strength is an individual strength. Uh, and they believe that business in the free market is the engine of change and the engine of growth for them. They just don't see this as a market, free market versus government exchange. And I think the one question that we've asked that, that I think that, that highlights that the most is at the bottom of page four of this, the percent who agree with this statement, a free market economy needs government regulation to serve the public interest. That's a sentiment that a majority of Americans will agree with, but it is a particularly standout majority among millennials. They believe in the free market, they believe that business is going to be the energy for growth, but they also believe that the government plays a role in that. And that gets to that, that overarching point that I would leave you with, which is whether it's an environmental debate, jobs versus the environment, that's a trade-off debate that doesn't really resonate with this generation. They don't want to hear about that as a trade-off, one or the other. We have to pick. Why can't we have both? Is it government versus business? Well, why can't we have both? You know, that, that seeing things in those black and white terms is often a way to not engage uh, with the millennial generation. And I think to the extent that this generation already makes up, I think, a quarter of the adult population and growing, and we're not seeing any evidence in the youngest part of this generation of a move in a different direction on, those, on, on that kind of viewpoint. Uh, this is the big voting block moving into the electorate. And to go back to 2012 election, surprised all of us in their level of engagement. Because I think almost every pollster going into 2012 underestimated how many young people would vote. Because on our old measures of engagement and political participation, they were lagging. And every sign that we were used to looking at suggested that they weren't going to turn out in the way that they turned out in, 2012, in 2008, yet they did. Um, so there's a level of engagement. I think they're going to continue to grow as the focal point of the electoral system, but they have a different view about the electoral debates that we're having right now. So let me leave it with that and open it up for questions. Questions from anyone in the audience? So Arthur Brooks today, you guys have written and spoken a lot about the need for Republicans to talk about how our policies help the poor uh, better than the other side. And, uh, and, and so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how we speak, um, particularly the young people, and, and um, kind of bridge that disconnect between um, helping the poor um, and that sort of crowding out effect that we often believe that the government has on charities and churches and other institutions without, without alienating um, that, that Right. I, I, it's, a, it's a great point. And I think the, 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 probably the singular 
piece of advice is try to take as much of the anti-government rhetoric out of it. You know, that, that it's about other ways of solving those problems, but not always coming back to close down government, treat government, treat government, because that's, that's, that's just a tone that doesn't, that doesn't sit in very well. Uh, now, part of that is, and, and, and let me step back slightly from, a, from the broad theme I said, you also don't want to overgeneralize any generation. There's a lot of diversity within the, the millennial generation. They're not an overwhelming, you know, they're, they're, their tendency is more liberal, their tendency is more pro-government, but there's a big spectrum inside of the generation. And part of why that, that imprint is inherently a, a compositional one, as the sociologists would call it. This is a generation that's 41% non-white. Uh, the generation behind it is likely to be close to 50, if not more than 50% non-white. And the anti-government kind of tone is one that really doesn't resonate with the non-white segment of that particularly. Um, so you're, you know, the, I think that all of the millennial generation, white, non-white, younger, older, I think believes in the idea that getting ahead is an individual act. You know, that kind of discussion point is going to, I think, resonate very well. But it doesn't mean there's a zero role for government in helping in that process. That's, it doesn't have to be either or. I think that's, I don't know if that helps, but I think the more that the conversation veers over into being, we got to get government out of this, that's, that's where they start to tune out. How do you get your data? I'm just always leery of polls yeah. <laughs> Excellent point. He, I, it's a good point. Uh, being leery of polls is, I think, fine. And I'll say that as a pollster. No, I, uh, we, we, we get our, I'll start with the beginning of your question. Our surveys are national, almost all national, and they're what are referred to as random digit dial surveys, which means we're not working off of lists of people or voter databases. We're just calling random phone numbers in effect, randomly. We know what numbers are active at any given time. We're not calling to, to reduce, just calling numbers that are out of service. But we're calling people randomly because our objective is to try to get the broadest picture of the national public, many of whom are never going to vote, many of whom may not even be citizens. Uh, but we want to get the current public in the United States. Uh, we do reach a pretty good number of millennials because as of now, 60% of our calls are going out to cell phones. And as we know, most, not most, but uh, well, close to half of millennials no longer have landlines in their homes. Um, so the cell phone component is a big one, and actually we find a pretty decent response rate on the cell phones. It's been more successful than most pollsters thought it would be, but it's a lot more expensive. Um, so if you're thinking of broad national surveys, most of the ones you'll see, Gallup, New Research, um, most of the media polls are going to include those cell phone national, you know, kind of broad pictures. <coughs> The response rates are much lower than they used to be. I think most of us, those polls are lucky if we complete an interview with 10% with roughly. Uh, I shouldn't say lucky, but it's around 10% of the numbers we attempt to call. Uh, that's a factor, it's a result of two factors. One is fewer people answer because everybody has caller ID and they're less likely to pick up if they don't know who's calling them. Uh, but partly because even when they do answer, people have a more inherent distrust of who's reaching out to them at any given point. Um, so the response rates are down. Most of the research we've done uh, suggests that, at least knock on wood, to this point, there's not a political slant to that, to that. That Democrats and Republicans are equally uncomfortable or comfortable talking on the phone. Uh, we have a harder time reaching young people, but that has less to do with their ideology and political thinking than just that they live busier lives. Uh, that their access points are less phone-oriented in terms of a traditional telephone conversation and more in the new space of communication that we were, we've been talking about here. Uh, so it, it poses a challenge in reaching them, but we still seem to reach a pretty good cross-section of, of, of younger people in that respect. So I think a, 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 a healthy skepticism of polling is, is, is a good thing. Um, and different polls do serve different purposes, whether it's a campaign poll that's trying to test change and strategic uh, implications versus what we do, which are these sort of broad national portrait polls. Different methodologies are applied, uh, different approaches can be taken um, for different, different effect. Anyone else? We have a gentleman who's the social media panel before you. If you guys have any polling on where the younger generation and the older generation, where they're getting their news and how they're getting plugged into politics. 
we, we do and we have. Yes, I think uh, social media is playing a bigger role in it. But obviously, a lot of that social media is ultimately a link to a traditional media source to some extent. Now, you know, depends how you define what traditional media is. But most of the actual sourcing is still within the realm of media as we think of it. But the access point is often through the social media space. And I think the point that was raised before uh, is a critical one, that the, the trust issue is interpersonal trust is higher than any other kind of trust. People are going to trust something that was referred to them by somebody that they know and, and, and believe in. So that, that secondary rippling effect of things can have a, a much more powerful impact on what people are going to take the time to click on, follow through, and read than what's put before them from an editor at the New York Times or, or, or an editor at the Huffington Post, even. Uh, people are going to, I think it does change the fundamental way that people think about and approach uh, the information that they're getting because a lot of it's coming in through those sort of personal connections. I think one of the questions that that, that raises is, does that can, does that create information bubbles? You know, people are only hearing from people that they know, potentially people they agree with on a lot of political issues, and that does that contribute to or, or exacerbate a polarization of thinking as people's information streams become increasingly channeled in that way? That's actually a big research project we're undertaking this year to try to understand how that changing information environment may be affecting political things. But again, the generation that is most susceptible to that is the generation that is in some ways the least ideological in, in terms of thinking of everything in kind of red, blue, black, and white terms. One last one. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned that uh, millennials have tends to give not members of traditional organizations like voter clubs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. if, presuming that is Why is there trust government? What, what, what is what's kind of going on there? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the, we actually find it, it goes even beyond institutions. Uh, millennials actually show lower levels of trust of others. You know, just normal people that you run into and you don't know. Their trust measures on sort of a lot of old sociological measures are lower than older generations. And then their confidence or identification, at least, with a lot of other institutions is lower, to, to your point. Yet when you get up to the government level, their trust levels tend to be higher. And that is sort of a, a puzzle or a conundrum. I think one way to, to unpack it is, again, it has more to do with how people think of themselves. Uh, that, that a lot of older generations thought of themselves, almost your identity is tied up in the groups that you associate with over time, whether it was the teams or clubs you belonged, with, belonged to in high school, uh, college, uh, and so forth as you went through your life, that the, that the new environment that people are living in that's more digitally focused really rethinks the way people think about their associations and their memberships, so to speak, in those things. I don't know that it's that young people inherently distrust those institutions, uh, it's that they just don't find them as relevant, you know, in terms of thinking or, or even wanting to identify themselves in a box, so to speak, that, well, if I identify as a Republican, that means I have to think all of these things, or if I am going to join Club X, it means I have to sign on to the bylaws, or this, and, and, and in a kind of networked way of thinking, that doesn't, that's not an appealing kind of identification for, for people. So there's a little bit of a distrust there because it's, there's a sense, I think, that a lot of those group identifications imply putting, a, putting constraints on, on your approach to things, and that in and of itself is not very appealing. Again, some of that's just age. Young people are always like that, but this is a generation that's not necessarily that young anymore, and the trajectory is moving, again, if anything, in the, in the other direction towards increase decreased association rather than an increased association, which is sort of the normal life cycle, so to speak. Okay. Mike, thank you sure. very, very much.